and uh, many times people are lost trying to find themselves I heard this person who had a dog and he wanted to um, make his dog disappear um, my family wants to do the same thing their dog my brother's dog but so uh, maybe they'll learn a tip so he wanted to uh, take the dog somewhere in the woods and drop him there so he did it went to the woods dropped the dog comes back house to the house before he even gets to the house realizes the dog walks back into the into the driveway he took the dog and took him very far about 45 minutes somewhere into the all back roads and and dropped the dog and then he realized he got lost so he calls his wife and he says can you check if the dog came back the wife looked out of the window and says yes he did he says put him on the phone I need directions <laughs> Andrew Carnegie um, in 1904 started a fund called Heroes Fund where um, anyone who risks their life to save someone will be rewarded either with a scholarship, financial benefits uh, and they receive this particular medal and ever since 1904 9,893 so around 10,000 medals have been given to people who risk their lives to save others. Just this year alone 72 medals have been given to these people and about 39 million dollars have been spent to help these heroes. Um, that's not Andrew Carnegie. Uh, there was another image there. Uh, you don't have it. It didn't make it to the email okay it's a rich guy with the poster okay we are in a generation that is obsessed with these guys the superheroes right uh, you know these movies they make bank uh, they make tv series out of them the comics um, and there is a there's an inner drive within each one of us to be a hero a hero is not someone who goes to Olympics you know and jumps really high runs really fast even though some of them become heroes because they overcome challenges to get to that point but uh, the real hero that we're going to talk about today is people who spend their life to rescue others I'm going to just mention to you a few found them online and found really encouraging Nicholas Winson in 1938 he saved 600 kids he was in Czechoslovakia and what he did is he put these kids personally on the train and send them out to UK so about 600 kids because they were about to be deported and to be you know killed in consecration camps eventually they calculated that just within about 50 or something years there's 5,000 people that came out of descendants of these 600 kids that were rescued because of this man. The interesting part is no one knew about this for about 50 years. He even hid it from his wife so she doesn't report him to the authorities. His wife on accident found this out by cleaning up an attic and found out receipts and found out pictures of the children that he saved, 600 of them. He's a hero. Now is Bolin. Now most of you will not think of him as a hero in this sense but this man is the one that invented ejected seat. You know like in the airplanes when something's wrong with the airplane and the seat ejects and you know they have the parachute. So he is the inventor of that. He made money, big money for, for creating that kind of a seat until one day Volvo they hired him as many many years ago to work for some of their uh, some of the other departments and this is the man that invented something we use every single day or should be using that saved millions of people has been estimated he invented a seat belt there's been no seat belt up to, the, up to that point and what he did is he says for Volvo he says I don't want to just make more money he says I want to invent something that will be able to change people's lives even after I die today a seat belt you, you don't even have a car without a seat belt but this is the man that invented and said no he didn't risk his life he just leveraged his wisdom and his intelligence to be able to affect the humanity and to save people's lives James Harrison 
he saved two million lives from the blood he donated it's very interesting this guy has a very rare thing in his blood that actually helps to fight disease and for all his life he has went to donate his blood 1,000 times and they calculated from the donating of his blood two million people have been dead today if he wouldn't donate his blood so one man donates his intelligence the other man he donates his blood a one man he just donates his opportunities and he saves other people Edward Jenner he invented the first vaccine and defeated the smallpox in 18th century in 18th century alone in Europe 400 million people died from this disease and this man invented a vaccine we all know a guy named Joseph in the Bible and because of the wisdom God gave him he saved not only Egypt but he saved the world we know the queen a lady who became very popular because of her looks but she used her looks not just to become the beautiful woman the, the Mrs. you know Babylon she leveraged her beauty to rescue an ethnic group of Hebrews and today a book is written in her name movies are created in her name not because she was cute but because she used her beauty to leverage as a leverage to save other people we were created within us with the desire to save people whether it's a guy in Oregon when the shooting started in the library he goes in and tackles the shooter and risks his life gets shot but rescues other people from being shot or three guys who went to a movie theater with their girlfriends and the shooter opened fire and they shielded their girlfriends by themselves getting shot and getting killed or if it's a person that's 72 years, 72 years old and he is retired and he drives by a house that is on fire and instead of just calling firefighters he runs into the upstairs and he finds there's a 70, 7 year old girl that is, that is there and he rescues her and himself gets admitted to coma because of the fire burns he receives within us whether you're Christian or not is within us there is that thing when a danger comes in we run to help a study has been done in Germany where they took 18 year old uh, uh, 18 month old toddlers and they found out that when a parent goes in and does not have enough um, to to it, their, their hands are full and they need to open a cabin a kid will hold a toy and will drop a toy just to help their parent open the cabin it's within children it's within adults God wired you because he made you in his image and likeness to save others to help others amen and Jesus demonstrated that to us the story that really uh, touched me is now it's been made into a movie uh, called Sully it's about a, a captain uh, the pilot you see his picture on January 19 and January 15 2009 flight uh, 1549 from New York had this captain had about 155 people that was on this flight and as they were taking off large group of birds large birds they hit that flight and they hit that engines and both of the engines they collapsed and so this captain who was a you know a veteran captain he experienced he was very experienced they said there was no one else at that time who could have been better to handle that situation than him he knew he couldn't be able to get back on the on the airstrip he wouldn't be able to go to the nearby airport and he makes the very unthinkable decision crazy decision to land the plane in the Hudson River you have to understand he says when I made a decision to land the plane in the Hudson River he says I remembered a flight Ethiopian flight that landed in the ocean and when you land a plane and I'm not a pilot so don't uh, but I listen to a lot of stuff on pilots and I found out is that when you land a plane in the river or in the lake one small little thing when your wings are not straight and it flips the plane out and it destroys the whole plane in pieces that's exactly what happened to Ethiopian plane so here is a man who has 155 people a small little tweak a small little thing with the wheel and it's going to completely destroy his life and the life of 155 people 
and the way he landed the plane is the most of you already heard the news is that it saved all of those 155 people and he became a hero there is a clip that 60 minutes did where um, he talked to those people for a few minutes and what they said and I want you to watch this clip before we actually go into the message so if you can go ahead and turn on the clip your eyes on the screen this is the captain and these are the people that he is reconnecting with who were on that flight Hi. Amy Jolly. Hi Amy. How are You're you? You're saving my life. You did an incredible job. Thank you. Really, really, really proud. Thank you so much for bringing my husband home to me. What's your name? Sherry Leonard. Judy. Hi, Judy. Hi. Thank you so much. You kept our family together. You are our hero. Yes. There's Thank you. The whole crew. More than one woman came up to me and said, thank you for not making me a widow. Thank you for allowing my three-year-old son to have a father. You're very welcome. Yeah. Wow. It's unbelievable. One man had told me that, you know, I was looking at him, he was in first class, and he seemed to be very anxious. And I just told him, just, you know, be calm and, you know, just try to breathe. I can't tell you how frightened I was that we were coming down, and I was just thinking, this person is looking at me, and she's telling me everything's going to be fine. Thank you again. Good okay. to see you. He showed me a picture of uh, himself with his um, niece, and the niece um, was the child of his um, brother who was killed in 9-11. And he told yeah. me he didn't think that his family could take losing a second son. My brother was a firefighter killed at the Trade Center. In the whole way down, I'm thinking, my family is not going to survive this. I've got to get off this airplane. I can't believe that everyone walked off that airplane. It's a miracle, and I, I really thank you. 155 is a number, but when you can put faces to it, and not just the 155 faces, but the, the other faces, the wives, the daughters, the sons, the fathers, the mothers, the brothers, you know, it's, it's, it gets to be a pretty big number pretty quickly. Captain Sullenberger says he plans to fly again, but he's not sure when. For now, he and his family are finding comfort going through the mountain of mail he's received from all over the world. Dear Captain Sullenberger, in a world that seems to be full of bad news, it was such a wonderful day on January 15th. Think about not only the 155 passengers, but all the families who belong to these people. Dearest Captain Sullenberger, Big Apple Hero, yesterday I received a voicemail from my 84-year-old father who lives on the 30th floor of a building with river views here in Manhattan. Had you not been so skilled, my father or others like him in their sky-high buildings could have perished along with your passengers had not you landed in the river as you had. As a Holocaust survivor, my father taught me that to save a life is to save a world. As you never know what the person you've saved nor his or her prodigy will go on to contribute to the peace and healing of the world. Bless you, dear Captain Sullenberger. New York loves you. That is my favorite one. Yeah, yeah mine too. You've been called a hero by a lot of people. How do you feel about that? I don't feel comfortable embracing it, but I don't want to deny it. I don't want to diminish their thankful feeling toward me by telling them that they're wrong. I'm beginning to understand why they might feel that way. And why is that? Something about this episode has captured people's imagination. I think they want good news. I think they want to feel hopeful again. And if I can help in that way, I will. I'm going to read from the scriptures, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. And as I've mentioned uh, these stories and you may say that well you know a lot of these are not necessarily biblical stories but the story I'm gonna read to you is very similar to exactly stories as such except the people who are heroes in the stories were not pilots uh, they were not beauty queens um, they were not inventors and they were not brave people who ran to rescue people from the fire these heroes were least likely to be heroes they were lepers and they not only saved their life they saved the life 
of entire city. And they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is the day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. We know the background of the story is the city of Samaria was besieged by this particular enemy. They ran out of food, people started to die. Things became so severe and so hard and difficult that people started to eat their own children. This is when you know that the situation has already become not bad, it's become unbelievably bad. There were four lepers outside of the city and these four lepers, they also ran out of food. And the leprosy is a, they call it Hansen, Hansen disease, it's a skin disease. This particular disease, you know, we don't see much of the leprosy in the United States. Actually the statistics said there's about 67, you know, cases of a severe, severe leprosy in the United States. A lot of the skin diseases, they're very treatable and some of it is not noticeable to the public. But this skin disease caused them to be outside of the whole city. And they were outside and they were there dying not because of a disease but because of starvation it's interesting that they were sick but it's not what was killing them leprosy as dangerous as it is as terrible as it is it wasn't deadly what was deadly is their hunger and they were looking for a solution not for the leprosy they were looking for a solution for something more important than leprosy at that moment it was their hunger we have many people in our city today who are, are like, like lepers. Maybe they have different problems and different challenges but the biggest need people have is not to fix their temporary problem. It's to fix the spiritual problem. The deadliest need is sin. The deadliest problem is our, is our separation from God. Not just our poverty, not just even our sickness or not even tormenting thoughts that we have or suicidal tendencies and all of these things. These things are important but the deadliest problem that humanity has, that people in our city have is the fact that they're sinners and Jesus Christ is the only one that's the solution. As these lepers, they were not looking for healing. They were looking for something that was more important for them at this point is they were looking for their salvation. And they go into the enemy's camp and when they found their bread over there, they found the help over there, then they got so full that they started to bring into their own tents and fill their tents and something clicked inside of them says this is not right what we do. We need to go and tell others that we found this otherwise a punishment will come upon us. The greatest need that humanity has is not to get married, it's not to even get money, it's not to even get health. The greatest need is to have a relationship with God. Can somebody say amen? Is to have their sin be dealt with by the cross of Jesus Christ. You can be a sick person or you can be a healthy person. You can be in Samaria who don't have leprosy or outside of Samaria who have leprosy. But both of the camps had a deadly problem. People who are in the hospitals and people who live in the mansions in Tri-Cities. Without Jesus Christ we have a deadly problem and Jesus Christ is the only one who can answer the problem, who can change the problem and we see what these lepers did and I want to share with you just three simple tips on how to be more effective in sharing your faith. One is they shared or they explained what they experienced. Lepers went into the city and told the city what they've tasted. They told the city not that the city is dying. They didn't come to the city and say, well, you guys rejected us. You threw us out. So I hope you die. They didn't go into the city and they, they didn't just tell the city, you guys are just a bunch of, bunch of bad people and you're eating your children. You know what? You deserve that. They came into the city. They didn't debate. They didn't tell them about the world, world hunger. They didn't tell them about the chemicals of bread and how important food is to a human body. They came to a city and they say, guys, we have ate some food. It's right there and y'all can have that food as well. Jesus didn't call us to be lawyers. He called us to be witnesses. Witnesses do not debate. They do not persuade, they do not try to defend, witnesses only share what they've seen and what they've experienced. 
God anoints us to be witnesses not to be lawyers our goal is to win souls not to win arguments many Christians we have to know our faith we have to know what we believe we have to know the difference between Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and atheism we have to know why and what we believe in but we must understand a person with an argument is not the person who's gonna win it's the person who has an experience is the person who's gonna win if you ask people who uh, did drugs they never went to a school to learn how to spread the ministry of drugs what did they do they got high and they liked it and they went to someone and they said do you want to feel better yes well this is what you try it's illegal it's dangerous it's addictive but there was something about experience that makes you this person with influence makes you the person who can influence others faster than the person who just has basic knowledge about a product or about a thing amen or it's like a, you know sometimes you go to a dealership uh, I remember once I went to a, a BMW dealership and if you go to a BMW dealership and the person is trying to sell you a BMW who drives a Camry is only a salesman <laughs> And a lot of times that's exactly how it is. We feel like we're just people who are like salespeople. We're just trying to tell people, say, hey, you really, really need Jesus. But if you tasted him, if you experienced him, you only need to open up your mouth and say like the blind man, I was blind, now I see. You do whatever you want with that. But this is what happened to me. People will never argue with your experience. Can somebody say amen? We must understand the most effective witnesses are not those who are the most educated. They're the people who had an experience. And that's why our desire for the church is not to create a church where people get information, where people get a revelation, where people get an experience, where people experience demons coming out, where they experience sickness leaving, where they experience their life changing. And only people with experience become the best witnesses in our community. A woman at the well, like Martin mentioned today, she was a broken person. She did not know the prophecies. She went into the city and said, the man I met knows everything about me. There was an experience that she had. That experience was so compelling that the whole city, especially men, all came out to see that man. You are most effective in your witness, not when you use the knowledge you have, but when you use the experience you had with the Lord to bring to other people to say, listen, this is what happened to me. And the same can happen to you. That's why the Holy Spirit came to make us witnesses. How can you make a witness? You learn to witness? No. What that means, Holy Spirit came to give you experiences to witness about. The Holy Spirit wasn't sent to send you to seminary. He was sent to send you into an experience that when you have something to say, you come from your own experience. Now we have people here today who, you know, who maybe lived right all their life. You didn't do anything bad. You don't have to do bad to always have a testimony. You can have a testimony because of the Holy Spirit, not because of the sin that you did. Our brother who shared the testimony today, it wasn't the drugs that gave him the testimony. It was the Holy Spirit that gave him the testimony. Testimony. and many people say well you know I need to go and really do bad stuff to have something to testify I know people who are buried in our cemeteries in Tri-Cities who believed in that the drugs don't give you a testimony Holy Spirit gives you a testimony seek the Holy Spirit and you will have a testimony can somebody say amen and the Holy Spirit can give you a testimony of how he uses you to touch other people not just even your own life but the first point that we learn we cannot be effective witnesses if we don't have an experience most of us here we have an experience of experience of someone else use your experience the guy who invented a seat belt used his knowledge a guy who invented the, the vaccine, he used his, he used his knowledge. You know, we, we see that this captain, he used his knowledge. He used his experience in flying. God wants to anoint you to use your experience to touch other people's lives. People who say, I, I can't tell anybody about Jesus. I, don't, I can't invite. I haven't invited anybody. It's because you don't use your experience. Use what you've tasted. And the Bible says the Lord is good. Taste and see the Lord is good. The Bible says that we know that He is good. When we taste of his goodness when we taste of what he's done in our life and we begin to share that something begins to happen we draw and captivate people number two the city needs a good news the city needs a good news lepers came to the city and they brought the city a good news i liked what the video said he says people today need a good news people are tired 
everything uh, I have a little app on my phone it's called the news there was no news it's only Hillary and Clinton that's all I cannot wait till elections are done but then after that there's going to be someone else it's always some kind of a drama it's always Brad Pitt is divorcing or Julian is divorcing Brad Pitt it's always this this drama you listen to that and you're like Lord Jesus I'm no wonder people live longer before they didn't know this stuff they were disconnected their life were more peaceful they looked at their own life and they built their own life that is not the news people in the city they need a good news they don't need just the news you're going to hell that's not a news they know that it's like a person who uh, you know there was a one church and the devil came into the church the devil took the pulpit everybody ran from the church except one woman in the front the devil looked at her he says aren't you scared of me she said no he said, why aren't you scared of me? She says, I've been married to your brother for 30 years. I ain't scared of you. <laughs> people, some people go around the streets and they simply say, you're going to hell. You don't need to tell people obvious. Most people, they, they know they're going to hell because they're living in one. Lepers did not come to the city and say, guys, you're going to die. It was obvious they're going to die. The lepers came to a city with the good news. We are a good news church yes sin separates us from God but that's not the gospel that is only the introduction to the gospel the gospel is Jesus Christ dealt with the sin the gospel is that Jesus Christ heals the gospel is Jesus Christ delivers the gospel is Jesus Christ restores the gospel is the good news and the cities need a good news the cities are open to the good news can somebody shout amen you can win one or two people by scaring them but to win a multitude is going to take a good news. Look at all the crusades in the world where the most people getting saved. You will see one common denominator. People there get healed and people there get delivered. People are offered a good news. Not just a lecture on their human depravity. They're offered a message that answers the needs of people and that captivates masses. Masses are not captivated by condemnation, by putting people down. They are captivated by the message of salvation and the message of hope. And that is the message you have and I have in our arsenal. Don't walk around your city condemning people. Don't walk around your city putting people down. You say, but if I don't tell them they're going to hell, you know, they need to know. That's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, beautiful are the feet of those who come and bearing a good news and telling Zion, your Lord reigns. Some of us have ugly feet because the message we bring is you suck. The message we bring is your church is wrong. The best message we bring, you Catholic, Catholic, alcoholic, you're definitely going to hell. The message we bring, well, you, you, go to, you don't go to church. The message that we bring, oh, you, you have the sexual transmitted disease. How many people have you slept with? Well, now you have the answer. God just gave you the answer. That's why you're going to die of that disease. That is not the message Jesus wants you to bring. When Jesus met the woman at the well, he knew everything about her messed up life. He didn't give her a lecture on relationships. He didn't tell her, you're, you're, do you know that your life is, you have a generational curse in your life? He brought one positive thing about her. He says, you know what? She just lied that she did not have a man. He says, but you said the truth. She lied 98%. There's 1%, 2% that she said the truth that she wasn't married. He says, you know what? You, you're right. You actually said something very good. You said the truth. You don't have a husband. Jesus always lifted people, not brought them down. To impact the cities, our tongue has to be filled with positive news, not negative news. Our tongue has to be filled with the good news, not a bad news. Our tongue has to bring healing, hope and restoration, not negativity and bringing people down. And the Holy Spirit will use that to impact people. Can somebody say amen? Just a few weeks ago, there was a gentleman who came to our church and um, he, I guess when playing a game, he, he there was there was a part that was broken in his in his arm and we'll hear his testimony uh, hopefully next Sunday and so when on Wednesday and he wasn't even saved on Wednesday when God touched him and healed him he experienced healing in his body and now he's able to work without any pain he'd been to the doctor they they couldn't find any problem and last Sunday when he was here with us he gave his life to Jesus Christ and when they asked him what was the reason why did you give your life to Jesus Christ he says Jesus touched me he healed me and then I gave him my life to Jesus. The Bible says the goodness of God leads men to repentance. 
the goodness of God is meant to change God is good and he wants to be good to people and we are the messengers of that goodness can somebody say amen, amen. number three don't let your problems to stop you from fulfilling your mission these guys don't let your problem trump your purpose you know these guys they were lepers they were rejected and when they went to the city they were skeptical people looked at them and they said we don't believe that you're bringing a good news you're a trap but they did not allow the fact they had no influence with the city they didn't allow the fact that they were rejected they didn't allow the fact that they were not famous they were nobodies they were lepers they were not educated but their leprosy didn't stop them from going and telling high officials guys you can find bread a lot of us feel intimidated by people who are more educated than us some people feel intimidated to witness or to tell your manager or your boss about Jesus many of us we feel intimidated we only tell people quote unquote lower than us it means people working for us or people looking up at us and saying well you're a great guy and then we feel like well now I am in a great position these guys were lepers they had no influence over anybody but see they had an urgency inside of them that was bigger than the lack of influence that they had and they had the sense that if we don't tell anybody we're gonna get punished meaning we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be guilty we gotta do something about it and it's interesting they they could have said well when our leprosy is gone we're gonna tell everyone that we got food and we got healing they said if we already found food we're gonna go tell everybody about the food and we're gonna trust God he'll take care of the leprosy don't let the problem you still have to stop you from bringing other people to Jesus because Jesus has dealt with your issue of sin that gives you the right to start witnessing even if your finances are still not in order yet even if your family is still not there where it's supposed to be if you're a leper don't feel like well my leprosy disqualifies me from being a hero from being a savior that is not true I actually heard one explanation by a very famous preacher in America who quoted a Jewish rabbi that those four lepers were actually Gehazi and his three sons when Elisha pronounced the curse on Gehazi because of his selfishness he says on you and your descendants forever and the, the Jewish some of the Jewish uh, history says or the Jewish tale I would say better Jewish tale says that uh, Gehazi he was expelled from the city with his three sons and they were outside during that time we see that the reason why is because in Kings chapter 5 Gehazi gets the sickness in Kings chapter 8 Gehazi is standing in front of a king which we know the lepers cannot stand in front of other people especially in front of the king so Elisha's dead in Kings chapter 8 and Gehazi is standing in front of the king and tells the king about the good things that God has done and so this is what the Jewish tale says is that these four guys these four lepers were actually Gehazi and his three sons the reason he got the leprosy was because of his selfishness and when he was taking 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 something clicked inside the reason I am a leper is because I'm selfish and he says I can't do this anymore and he says I'm gonna go tell the city and when he goes in and tells the city this is what the tale says is that God supernaturally healed him of the very disease he got by selfishness and that's how he was able to stand in front of the king now whether that's true or not once we get to heaven we'll ask him but the truth is this if you minister to people even if you still have an issue God takes responsibility for that issue and begins to fix that issue when you take God's problem and make him your problem God takes your problem and makes it his problem when you become like Jehoshaphat who said God I'm gonna seek your kingdom and when the enemy comes against him God comes to Jehoshaphat and says this battle is my battle it's no longer your battle I'm gonna fight for you See, we all want those promises, but those promises are not handed over to just anybody. God gives those promises to people who take the position and take his problem upon himself. Be the person who takes God's problem by bringing people to Jesus. Fishing for people, looking for people, making people who come to church who are first time guests, feeling, making them feel special. Not just being around your own circle of friends, inviting those at your workplace that you have influence with and those you don't have influence with. I remember a story that has marked my life for, for a very long part of my life and it's a guy named Jason. He was coming to our church uh, for actually quite some time and then uh, reconciling to his wife, he, they moved to, uh, to another church in town and Jason 
was a drug addict. He was addicted to drugs and he was also addicted to alcohol. At one particular time, Jason's life was touched by God and he was admitted to a rehab, Mountain Ministries, in uh, a little bit over there in, um, uh, by Seattle area. He went to that rehab for first year. The rehab had two programs, first year and then the second year. During that first year, his life got on his feet. Everything was going great. And at the end of the first term, his son gets diagnosed with a hole in his heart. And so they were about to put him through surgeries and, and uh, all kinds of things that they said that his son might die. And Jason ends the first year and his wife calls him back, his ex-wife calls him back, says, hey, you're done with the program, come home. And Jason says, I really want to stay one more year to really get confirmed in my freedom. So when I come home, I come back as a completely changed man instead of a man who is still going to be prone to going back to drugs. His wife complained. A family said, what kind of a father are you? You're a terrible person. And he replied back to them. He says, if I come back and I'm not fully free, he says, how can I live with myself? What kind of a father am I then? He stayed for one more year. He put what God wanted more than even his personal screaming present situation. Within that year, all the stuff with his son worked out so good. The, the hole was gone. Everything was fixed. He came back from that rehab. And now it's been over 15 years. Jason never slipped back and his son and the other child, they have a father that is completely different man that was 16 years ago. Around the same time, there was a young man who was visiting our church who kept slipping back into drugs and alcohol, going back and forth and he just got his first child. And I remember me and Ilya consulting that young man and says, listen, we'll drive you to the same place. We know the people in the rehab. You don't have to pay anything because your grandpa, his grandpa spent $90,000, cashed out of his retirement, cashed out the equity out of his house to put him through all kinds of rehabs and nothing worked. And I was like, listen, go to that place for two years. In two years will pass like this. And after two years, I'm like, listen, you'll be a great father to your newborn baby. And that young man said, you don't understand. Ilya wasn't a father at the time and I wasn't and he said, he says, you guys are not fathers. You don't know what it's like to have a child. My child is my world. It's most important thing and she deserves me. I remember I told him, she doesn't deserve a drug addict. She doesn't deserve an alcoholic. Yes, he was without drugs for about four months because of her. Eventually he slept back, back into it, got a second child. We I talked to him again, say, please take a break. Please put your present screaming problem on the side. Put God first. He said, no, this is more important. I need to fix this first. And he was trying to be there with his family, but he wasn't capable of being with his family. He got a third child. And he did so much drugs that he went mental. And most of you seen on Untra City's, Untra City's Herald News, where he was admitted to a Benton County Jail about a year and a half or two years ago, where he beat himself to death in the Benton County Jail and I was there at his funeral and we were there leading other people to Jesus Christ and I remember standing and I'm like how God could have handled your children your children are now without you anyway God could have handled that if you would have put him first see God wants us to put his priorities first it's already been proven fact if you seek his first if you take care of what matters to God your leprosy is going to be taken care of God will take care of your leprosy. God will take care of your family. God will take care of your marriage. God will take care of your health. Put what matters to God as number one in your life. And I'm not saying ignore those things, but put those in the hands of God and say, God, you put your problem in my hands. I'm putting my problems in yours. And you will see one thing. God is so much better at handling your problems than you are. Can somebody say amen? amen. We've come to a time right now where I want us to pray for, for this very thing. We're going to pray for Samaria. We're going to pray. Our Samaria is Richland, Kenwick and Pasco. Our Samaria is the thousands of people that will be watching us online. Our Samaria is literally hundreds of thousands every week who watch our TV show that goes in on the Impact TV. Our Samaria is 800,000 potential viewers that watch us on Radiant Light and Charter Communications. Our Samaria 
is all the parents they get touched by people who go in with the yogi bear on Thursday night. Our Samaria is the people who get impacted on Saturday morning when people gather to go witnessing into the mall and into the fresh market. Our Samaria is everyone you come in contact with every single day at your work, at your gym, at the grocery shop or at the coffee shop. Our Samaria is every place I go in to preach next week. It's going to be in Vancouver. Two weeks from now it's going to be in, in Everett. Our Samaria is every video that gets posted on YouTube and gets watched in UK, in Malaysia, in all kinds of other countries that we get replies back. Our Samaria is social media. Our Samaria is all of those venues that is open right now. What we want to present and offer is not just religious material but life. Thing that brings healing to people. And we want to be light to the world, not just the religious bumper sticker. Assault means we make a difference in the place we go into. We have a testimony because of what God has done and through that He does it in other people's lives. And we want to see every home group be filled with new people that are saved. Every youth service be filled with new people that are saved. Every Sunday service be filled with new people that are saved. That's why morning prayers exist. That's why first week of the month, you know, we take three days to fast not just to lose weight and get on a Christian diet but to see God move mightily to save people's lives here and outside here and outside in Jesus mighty name can somebody say amen